from The Advocate magazine in partnership with GLAAD. This is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I think that by now, we as a community know that there is more to gender than just two. And yet still, the more we talk about it on a podcast, the more I believe that gender is simultaneously the most complicated and simple thing in the world. And it's complicated because we have made it that way, right? And so I'm hesitant to think that I personally know everything there is to know about gender. Because spoiler, I definitely do not. But that is why I wanted to call up Kate Bornstein, the great gender theorist, thinker, writer, to hear what we're missing from these now public conversations about gender. I want to know what are we getting wrong. And then also I wanted to check in with Kate and hear about how now in her 70s, her view on gender, both her own gender and just gender in general, has continued to evolve. And then before we hear it, just a note, I had an earlier conversation with Kate on the podcast back in 2018, where we chatted more in depth about her life and work. If you want to hear that, we have actually re-released it, and it's right under this one in your podcast feed. All right, without further ado, here's Kate. To begin with, in the last few years, we have really caught up to you in your work when it comes to gender. You've been talking about and writing about living outside the gender binary for over 30 years at this point, and now we're able to point to people like you and your work as one example of things we can turn to to read and learn. But early on, 30 years ago, what, if any, resources did you have? Were there books you were reading or people you were talking to, anything at all? There was no internet, and there was nothing to look at. If You, you could look up transsexual, but then you would get Christine Jorgensen, and you would get very conservative people, people who were born men, grew up, were living as conservative men, and transitioned into conservative women. And the freaks, their voice wasn't published. It was coming out through Warhol's films at first. That's where, that's where the real first non-binary presence was felt in the country. Jackie Curtis was calling himself, I'm not a man, I'm not a woman. I went, whoa, okay, let's talk about that. And for so long, your early work, that was how you described your gender, not man, not woman. Was that how it was commonly being discussed or was that like your individual like way to, to describe it? That was my individual way to describe it. I didn't know many people personally who were also looking at themselves in that way. But as more and more people started defining as trans, and as we had the internet, then I was hooking with people who did that define that way. So that's a really big difference than people today, where you were forced to invent language to describe your experience. Yeah, and in a way that was good. The sneaky thing about the word non-binary is it doesn't say what you are. It says what you're not. And that's what I was saying, not man, not woman, because I had no idea what I was. But people, some people seem to think that non-binary is an is, and it isn't. It's a not is. I also think that you defining yourself by what you're not, that goes against what we as people, I think, desire You know, we want concrete things, things we can touch and hold and name. That's why admitting that gender includes time, the passage of time, allows us to admit that gender, living with gender, is living with the process of letting go. Being able to let go has always been a problem for humanity. Letting go of anything. As you said, we we, we want something to hold on to. And gender is not something you can hold on to unless you get really angry about it. And, you know, there was something I wanted to ask about your first book, Gender Outlaw. With how much things are changing, for example, with this new administration, you're going to be able to get a passport that has an X under the gender marker. Things are starting to go the way where non-binary identities are becoming formally recognized parts of society. 
Is that forcing a shift in your own identity where you're thinking of yourself as less of a gender outlaw? It's helping me leave that identity behind. I saw gender in terms of, first off, the binary, man and woman, two-dimensional kind of thinking. And in order to say I'm neither, I had to get into a third dimension because that said there was something else that wasn't represented by a binary. So, okay, there are three dimensions, and that meant there was a limitless number of identities. Saying non-binary and watching so many say, people say they're non-binary has helped me get into a, a, a fourth dimension of looking at gender, if you will. And that's adding the dimension of time. And it's the idea that, you know it, I know, we all know it, but we hate to admit it, that gender is continually changing. We are changing our notion of gender, what we depend on to define ourselves as a gender continually changes moment by moment. So now, rather than saying just not man, not woman, I'm saying that my gender is a continuum. And currently a continuum of 73 years, if someone refers to me as him and he, I don't get angry. I go, yeah, that was part of who I was and, and still is, but wrong time. And with time, we now have this word non-binary, which is new. The word is new, not the experience. But having the word, something to call yourself, do you think that that has helped to legitimize it for other people in a way? Yes, to a point. And it's going to freeze non-binary into something that can be defined. At that point, non-binary will cease. It will be so dependent on the binary that it will, in fact, become part of it, paradoxically. Right now, non-binary isn't dependent on the binary. It just says, well, I'm not that. But the more we say non-binary, we're going to have to call up the binary in order to define ourselves. Defining ourselves by what we're not is, is a legitimate way of defining ourselves. That's what I like. For example, bisexual now while the word bi technically means to, people who are bisexual are understanding themselves to embrace a sexuality that we used to call pansexual. There was a magazine, a great magazine, called Anything That Moves. <laughs> I loved that. It was a magazine for folks who were bisexual. That idea of not having... Well, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Anything. What, 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 what. Explain it to me. To lay it out for me. No, because my life is an exploration. And what we're doing in that case is saying that we are on a continuum of sorts. We admit that time is a factor in our gender and that it's changing moment to moment to moment. And with those changes, it's not always as, you know, grand as male to female. It's like smaller changes too, right? Yeah. I mean, every day we find out something that goes, oh, oh, that kind of man. Oh, that kind of woman. You know, when, when we see WandaVision and we go, oh, yeah, okay, Scarlet Witch. I'm being Scarlet Witch. I'm loving that. We have redefined our gender a little bit. Or Loki, that's a way to be in the world. That, for me, has always been the fun of it. And so as these ideas get larger and more mainstream, we tend to dumb them down and oversimplify them. Is there something that you think we're misunderstanding in these public conversations about gender? I think we've always misunderstood that gender is a relational phenomenon. It depends on something else for its existence. What it depends on, it varies from time period to time period, culture to culture. Some cultures say it depends on hormones. It depends on genitals. It depends on your mood that day. It's still relational. And that is what we're missing. We're, we're not admitting that. Oh, because to your point, we have been 
We read about the early feminist movements. We've been redefining what it means to be a woman you know, as long as America's been around as America. And yet now when we continue to redefine it, people are like, whoa, you're redefining it. What are you doing? <laughs> right. We can conceptualize very easily something that's two-dimensional, either or. As soon as we go, yeah, but, we're starting to get into the idea of three-dimensional concept of gender. We're adding imagination to law, to what's been laid down. Yeah, that was done by the earliest feminists saying, not, 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 not going to be that kind of woman. And that was the start of the gender revolution. We are children of that. You know, going off what you said about gender being relational, depending on who you're around, etc., we have been inside for better part of a year, away from all people. How did you feel your own experience of gender, you know, shifting or evolving? Okay, speaking of time, age into the picture. All of a sudden, I was really really old. I'm 73. I thought I was going to be dead at like 39, 29. I thought I was going to be dead. I still think I'm going to be dead when I wake up first thing in the morning. I go, well, today I could die. I certainly am ready for it now. And so gender became inconsequential to me while I was in quarantine and grappling with old age. Oh, you're not old. 70 is the new 50. Fuck that. 70 is the same old 70. This is where you, you really need to be letting go of shit. And so if you haven't practiced before this, you get a lot of practice now. I'm letting go of the ability to be, all right, gender, cute in certain ways. I'm too old for that. My face is sagging. My boobs are sagging. Boy, oh boy, way down to my waist. <laughs> and you let go of that as being necessary to your gender. I think that that surprises me, you saying that in quarantine you let go of all gender and stop thinking about it. I think I'm surprised by that because I would have assumed you would have been saying that for the last like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I've been non-binary for a long time, but the fact of... Okay, there's gender identity and gender expression. Gender identity has been coming less and less important. Gender expression has always been important for me. And that's as much gender as identity is. And I, I guess what I was wondering is, you know, in the 90s and 80s, when you were trying to communicate how you experienced gender, without that, these like strong terms like identity and expression, like, were you just like, was it fumbling more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Totally. And I said the wrong thing a lot. I think I called it bipolar gender in, in, in the first edition of Gender Outlaw. And in the first edition of Gender Outlaw, I laid in another binary. Basically, I was saying to define yourself as a man or a woman is bad and false. To define yourself as neither is really good. And... In the second edition, I was able to pull that out because I was coming up with something new, this defining myself as not man, not woman, and I was digging my heels in. I was saying, and it's good, and it's right, and, 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 and to prove it, you're wrong. And so I got in so much trouble with binary identified trans people for that, and I don't blame Part of my gender has included gender theorist and, in some cases, gender icon. And quarantine has been letting go of that. I'm stepping back here. I'm watching other people write beautiful pieces of, of literature and theory, and I'm going, good, okay. I can just step back and watch and focus on basically end-of-life issues. I'm not dying. Well, of course I'm dying. But nothing, nothing like bad or anything is happening right now. But it is the end of my life. And 
I'm letting go of gender theorist, the need to be listened to. Pay attention to me. I'm saying what gender is now. I'm coming up with all kinds of gender theories still, but I don't have a need to get them out there. That's not part of who I am. It's not part of what I do. If people ask me, I'm very happy to talk about it because it's a fun conversation, but it's not important to me whether a whole lot of people connect with it and follow it anymore. So if getting those ideas and being a loud voice is not important to you, as you do near the end of your life, as you said, like what, what is important? All my life, for the most part of my life, I've been like totally fascinated with death. What the hell is that? And my mom, bless her heart, when I was 10 or 12 years old, said, Albert, do you know what I think about before I go to bed every night? Every night, I try to be there for the moment I fall asleep. I never can. Either I, I wake up and I oh, I just fell asleep, or I am falling asleep. But that actual moment of going to sleep never can get it. And I think if I can get it, I'll have a better idea of what death is like. Whoa! Mom! <laughs> and let's get back to Bur to Loki. I am burdened with glorious purpose, finding that moment of death. As close as I can come to it, death is the moment when you lose everything. Everything's gone. And so what am I doing now? I'm focusing on my losses. My back hurts most of the time. I, I can't, I can't move in a lot of ways that I used to be able to move. And I go, oh, well, lost that ability. When I was going through chemotherapy in 2012 through 2014, I experienced what's called chemo brain. And that stays with you. It's a phenomenon. You can Google it. And that's like fuzzy brain. That plus old age. I don't have access to language as good as I had before. Trying to write now, that's a lot more of a chore and a lot less of a delight. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, okay, that's gone. And now if I can keep saying, oh, well, if I can keep smiling about stuff that I lose, then at that moment of death, I'll be able to smile and go, oh, well, and see what What's next? So tell me about like after death. Like, do you think about your legacy and how you want to be remembered? No. I see how I am thought of more or less now. And I imagine that'll continue. And, and that's cool. You know, that, that's sweet. A, a lot of people like what I've written and like how I've written it and think of me as their auntie. And that feels good. That feels good to be part of a family. And so you're not like rushing to cross anything off like a to-do list. Hmm. No, I've, I've done a fuck of a lot in my life. I've gotten pretty much all the tattoos I want to get. If I could change something now, I would wish for better health, but I fucked up my health with, with cigarettes starting back when I was a teenager. So, you know, as you reap, so you shall sow. And that's come around now. I feel like this is a crazy question, but we're talking about preparing for death. And you seem very at ease and at peace with it. My only worry is, what if you happen to have like 20 more years? <laughs> Like, <laughs> you know, like, what's that going to look like? 20 years of loss and laughing at loss. We all have work to do here in the world. We, we all do. The only way to admit that you've got work and then find some serenity in life is to do your work and then let it go. Not, oh. I've got to make sure everybody agrees with me on this now. And I've, I've got to rewrite it and, and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it, which is what I did, you know? So back to that concept of letting go. 
So if there's another 20 years, I imagine I'll find some really good recipes. I, I've been cooking a lot in quarantine. <laughs> I imagine I'll get really even better than that. I don't think it'll have much to do with gender my next 20 years. If I have 20 years, I could have 20 minutes. It's not a sad thing. I was suicidal most of my young life and into my middle age, middle age and into my 40s and, and just up to my 50s. And something changed and I wasn't suicidal, but that didn't change my fascination with death, just my attitude toward it. Thank you so much for taking the time for this. This is fantastic. It's been lovely talking with you and seeing you virtually. Thank you for the good questions. And, and thank, you, thank you for letting me go way off the, uh, the notion of gender and into something else. And that was Kate Bornstein. If you'd like to hear our earlier conversation, it is right under this one in the podcast feed. And then as always, if you enjoyed the interview, please help us spread the word on social media. Post on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. When you do things like that, it is the biggest way you can help our show continue to grow and make new episodes. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with Glad. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I will see you next week. 